So, we have been looking at uh, algorithms to find optimal solutions when the state space has edge costs involved. We saw an example of uh, solving the TSP uh, using this algorithm called branch and bound. But let us come back to the problem that we originally started with, which is that you are at some start node and you want to find the path to the goal node. And the difference is going to be that now those edges will have cost and our goal is to find the optimal solution. So, let us see how branch and bound works there. We have studied with no edge cost, we have looked at blind search algorithms. So, depth first search, the deepest candidates are the best and dives headlong into the search space optimistically and does not guarantee the optimal path essentially. We saw that depth first search treats the shallowest candidates as best, stays as close to the start as possible and wades into the search space to find the solution with the shortest number of hops, simply because it stays at as close to the source as possible and the same strategy is going to be applied in branch and bound in state space search, stay as close as possible to the source node. Depth first iterative deepening also found the optimal solution, but it, it was basically simulating how breadth first search works. So, it was a depth first algorithm masquerading as breadth first essentially. Then at some point we looked at heuristic function and the idea was that to find the solution faster because we would look at estimates to the goal and then pick the node which appears to be closest to the goal essentially. So, pick the candidates with the lowest heuristic value in the hope of finding the solution sooner. So, the objective was to find the solution faster. Now, our objective is to find the optimal solution. So, branch and bound works as follows that organize a space that does not preclude any solution. So, we do not want to preclude any solution because we want to guarantee optimality. That is going to be a necessary condition. So, local search for example, used to always preclude all possible solutions. So, we just found some solution if we did. The search space could be the state space in which a partial sequence of moves is extended or the search space could be a solution space in which an abstract solution is refined. We saw that for in the TSP example, but now we are going to come back to the fact that we will have a partial path and we will keep extending the best partial path. We will continue looking for the solution, whether we are extending it or refining it until a complete solution with known cost is available and no other possible solution with a smaller cost exists. Again, this condition of lower bounding will have to apply and the basic idea behind branch and bound is to prune those parts of the search space which cannot contain a better solution. And the reasoning that we did by saying that you should have lower up bound estimates will apply here as well. So, let us say look at this tiny space search problem that we might have seen earlier. Uh, the move gen function is given on the left. So, from S you can go to ABC, from A you can go to SPD and so on and so forth. And the state space graph is shown on the right and there are edge costs involved now as you can see. The placement of nodes is not necessarily accurate, it is just a schematic. So, I have tried to draw them so that roughly they correspond to the length of the edge, but it may not necessarily be so I think. So, look at the edge cost. The question we want to ask is what is the shortest path? from S to G essentially. And when we say shortest, we now are thinking of those edge costs maybe as distances. So, maybe from S to B is 3 kilometers, from B to D is 4 kilometers and then what would be the shortest path including the edge cost, not in terms of the number of hops that you make in the state space. So, as we have been doing, each candidate is tagged with an estimated cost of the complete solution. In this algorithm that we are looking at which is branch and bound, this estimated cost of the full solution is going to be the actual cost of the partial solution that you have found. In other words, we will not look ahead towards the goal, we will only look at the current node as to how much cost we have incurred up to that node essentially. And then we will follow our same strategy, refine the best looking partial solution till the best solution is fully refined. And it is best seen with an example. 
So, what does branch and bound do? It extends the cheapest partial path essentially. So, we start with the start node and uh, there is only one node. So, we extend that path and we have now three successors for S. Uh, we use the following uh, notation that nodes in yellow are closed, nodes in without any color they are on open and this node in cyan or, or greenish is the best node amongst the nodes in open essentially. So, S has three successors as you can see, you can go to A with a cost 6 or you can go to B with a cost 3 or you can go to C with a cost 8 and the best one is B. So, we extend that this thing. What happens now? We are not doing loop checking here. We had seen uh, uh, when we were looking at DFID that loop checking can have its own drawbacks. So, we are just looking at the algorithm how it performs essentially. So, we define B and B again you have three successors. You can go back to S uh, by this path S B S and that has a cost of 6 because 3 plus 3 uh, or you can go to A uh, from B which is uh, got a cost of 5 as you can see which is better than the direct edge going to A which had a cost of 6. So, we have found a better path to A, but our goal is the G node. So, then we define that best node A because that is had a cost of 5 and uh, we have added these three neighbors to that. As you can see that as you keep going, you may be going in cycles, but uh, your costs are going up. So, a, the costs are going to S is include. So, one simple improvement we can do is that if the same node occurs in a path, then exclude that path that would be one simple improvement to reducing the search space that in any path every node should be included only once essentially. So, for example, you must not include this and you must not include this S and you must not include this B because B is already in that path that we are following and so on and so forth and that would make the search space a bit smaller, but we are just trying to understand the algorithm. At this stage, we have two nodes A and S who have a cost of 6 and we expand them in some, some order to get the tree that you see on the right hand side. Then after the expansion, we see that there are two nodes which have the lowest cost which is C and B with cost 8 and we would refine them. Then without going into the details, you can see that the algorithm will look at all these nodes whose costs are shown in, in, in yellow because they are all cheaper and eventually it will find this path which goes to G which is of course, 13. So, you should verify that after all these nodes which whose costs are shown in yellow, when it picks G then at that point G would be the cheapest path from start to goal. This for example, is more expensive, but before it picks that this will pick D. So, the same principle that we saw applies and this is the uh, Blanton bound algorithm applied to state space search essentially. We can of course, improve it by removing duplicates. So, as I said you can remove this B from here, you can remove this S from this search node, you can remove this S which means you will remove all of these from the search node uh, and what else uh, you can or see what we are doing is we are exploring partial paths. So, what are the partial paths? So, for example, this path says that you go from S to C and C to G and you just calculate the cost S to uh, C is 8 and C to G is 8. So, that is 16. You go from S to A to B that cost is 8. You go from S to B directly and that cost is 3. So, basically all these are partial, these are all paths. So, what this algorithm is doing is simply keeping track of all paths that it has found and extending the cheapest one and that is why every node has a cost associated with which is the cost of reaching that node. So, for example, this node D at the bottom, how does it get the value 11? 
it gets a value 11 because from s you have gone to b, from b you have gone to a. So, I am just following the path in the search tree. From a you have again gone to b and from b you have come to d. So, this is the path s b a b d. Of course, b you have visited twice, but that is why this is not going to play a role in the final solution essentially. What is the cheapest cost, cost of going to d is from s to b to d that is 3 plus 4 7. So, from s to b to d this would have been the cheapest way of re reaching d. So, obviously, as we will see further, uh, we will next we will look at Dijkstra's algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, once it has found that the path to d is by a 10, it will just simply prune the other possible paths. In fact, it does not even represent possible paths. So, that is what we are going to do next, I think. Okay, so, here we are with the Dijkstra's algorithm. It is a very well known algorithm. The only difference between what we are trying to do and what Dijkstra's algorithm is designed for is that Dijkstra's algorithm says that you are given a source node and you have to find the shortest paths to all other nodes essentially. We are not interested in all other nodes, we are interested in a particular goal node. So, in this particular example, it turns out that you end up visiting the entire state space anyway essentially. So, how does the algorithm work? So, you might have studied this in some course. Basically, it begins by assigning an infinite cost estimate to all the nodes except for the start node. It assigns the color white to all the nodes initially. So, this is how the algorithm has been described by Dijkstra. Uh, it picks the cheapest white node and colors it black essentially, saying that okay, I found a path to that particular node essentially. And then it relaxes, it inspects all the neighbors of the new black node and it checks if a cheaper path has been found to those neighbors and if yes, then we update the path. So, we will only keep one path from start node to any other node essentially, unlike the algorithm that we saw in which there were many different paths uh, that were maintained, but that obviously was wasteful work. So, if you have found a cheaper path, then update the cost of that node and mark as to which is the parent node essentially. Hmm. So, Dijkstra's algorithm keeps track of these parent pointers. So, let us look at the algorithm in this uh, uh, same problem that we are looking at. Uh, as you can see uh, that here all nodes have been assigned an infinite cost or it could be some the largest possible number that you can think of or whatever the case may be. And we start with the source or S and that is the only node that you have. So, you pick that node and color it black. Okay. So, when I say black, I have not drawn black. So, orange is the new black as you can see. And then what has happened is that you have found paths to A to B and to C. So, these are represented by the back arrows and the estimates of those nodes have come down from infinity to the shortest path that can be found to them, which is a single hop. So, we follow the same uh, convention saying that we will mark the cheapest node or cheapest white node actually, because Dijkstra called them black nodes and white nodes, cheapest white node and we are going to refine that or relax that essentially. So, what is that the node is B because it has a cost of 3, the other two have cost 6 and 8. So, we refine that and then we find that we have found a better path to A essentially. So, what Dijkstra's algorithm does is that initially there was an arrow like this, it removes that arrow and adds the arrow to the parent B from where the cheapest path to A comes. So, the cheapest path to A is via B. So, the back arrows point to that. Now, at this point A is the best node, it has a cost of 5, the other nodes uh, uh, on open. Remember B is already on closed and S is already on closed or so they have been colored black in Dijkstra's terminology. 
So, out of 5, 7 and 8, A is the best. So, we define that, we color it black and uh, the value for path to D has not changed because the best path to D is still from B and that is maintained in this back pointer. So, that has not changed. So, so coloring black, A black did not change anything. Then of the open nodes, the best one is between C and D, the best one is D. So, we define that and we have found one path to the goal, which is uh, can be followed by the back pointers that you came to G from D, you came to D from B and you came to B from S. But of course, we have not yet, we are not going to pick goal at this moment because the algorithm says pick the cheapest white node and color it black. The cheapest white node at this stage is C with a cost of 8 and we color it black and as far as the goal is concerned, nothing changed because the path to the goal via C which is as you can see 8 plus 8 is 16, whereas the path that we have found to goal is 13 which is via B and D. So, that does not change essentially. If, if for example, this edge cost between C and G instead of 8, if it was uh, let us say 4, uh, then uh, this would become the better path, if, but only if this was 4. That is not the case. So, in this example, uh, nothing changes. E is the next cheapest node. So, we color it black and finally, we pick up G and we have found the cheapest path to the node G essentially. So, the same path that of cost 13, which Blanche and Brown found, Dyson algorith algorithm also finds it. It is a little bit more elegant in the sense that you do not have this hugely growing search space, search tree and you are only modifying the graph in some sense and this is what we will do uh, or this is what we will uh, uh, inherit from Dijkstra's algorithm when we look at this algorithm A star which is going to be of interest to us. Now, branch and vine has no sense of direction essentially. So, it only does on Dijkstra's algorithm which is the same thing. Uh, it extends the cheapest path at any point essentially. So, starting with this start node, you can see that branch and bound will first explore all the neighborhood uh, or at least most of the neighborhood before moving on to this node or this node or this node and so on essentially. That is because it like breadth first search in some sense, it tends to stay as close to start as possible. And, uh, branch and bound will first explore that, that part essentially. So, just imagine it is like if you are in IIT Madras and you want to go and visit uh, uh, let us say the Shor temple in Mahabalipuram and you want to use branch and bound. So, branch and bound will first explore the entire Chennai city before heading off south essentially. So, it has no sense of direction, but it does guarantee you the shortest uh, path because it always stays as close to the source as possible like breadth first search. Best first on the other hand only looks ahead essentially. So, if there are two nodes on open shown in the blue here, you can see that it looks like the shortest path is from here, but somehow best first has come to find this node and that appears to be closest, closest to the goal. So, best first will not necessarily find the shortest path essentially that we have already discussed essentially. What we need is an algorithm which will uh, behave like branch and bound, but also have a sense of direction like best for search. That is going to be our next uh, algorithm and this is the algorithm A star, which combines the best features of both. So, we will do that next.